here and give a quick introduction to uh, doc, our speaker today, Dr. Alan Lake, who is a research entomologist at the USDA ARS Invasive Plant Research Laboratory in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, Ellen went to Bryn Mawr College and graduated in 1999. She majored in biology and anthropology. Uh, she was uh, uh, an education director at the Brandywine and Red Clay Valley Associations. Um, she then got her master's and PhD at the University of Delaware um, in entomology and entomology and wildlife ecology, respectively. Um, and her research focused on biological control of myelominate weed, um, and integrating biological control with herbicides. There's that integrating word, so it definitely fits in with IPM, um, as is biocontrol. Um, and she uh, was had a short stint as a visiting professor at the College of New Jersey, uh, and then joined USDA ARS uh, in 2012 and has been there uh, since. And she'll uh, take it from there and uh, talk to us about her research uh, involving biological control and, and trying to improve the success of biological control on weeds in various ways. So uh, take it away, Ellen, thank you. Great, thank you. So instead of a traditional weed biological control talk where we talk about a target weed and start in the uh, native range for overseas exploration, testing, et cetera, I decided to highlight a couple of broader biological control projects looking at uh, a few less tangible issues in a variety of systems, uh, agent hybridization, some biotic resistance and apparent competition work that we've done, and because you guys are IPM folks, some integrated weed management and restoration work to wrap us up. I want to emphasize this is a big collaborative effort, uh, and I find that a very enjoyable way to work. And a number of really talented scientists from different, different organizations have contributed to this work. So just to get us all on the same page to get started, biological control can be a tremendous conservation tool. Agents are self-dispersing, self-perpetuating, and they can get into areas that are very difficult for humans to access. So for example, this is my primary target weed, old world climbing fern, all this kind of uh, bright green draping through here. And this is a sawgrass prairie that's been invaded in a very remote area of Everglades National Park. So why do non-native weeds cause invasive problems? Well, the enemy hy release hypothesis suggests that these species increase in abundance and distribution in their introduced range because they arrive without the natural enemies, the herbivores, pathogens, predators, parasitoids that keep them in check in their native range. So biological control is a very testing-based, highly regulatory process in which those natural enemies may be reintroduced to try to uh, reachieve that top-down control. And you can think about that process as a filter of safety, a series of sieves in which you start with observations in the native range where you have a suite of insects uh, found on or near your target weed. And you want to sort down from generalists to specialists. So we're looking for something like a monarch that specializes on milkweed. And eventually, as you start narrowing down that list to the insects that only seem to be associated with the target weed, you go through a series of experiments in quarantine to, to validate the host range, which can then be uh, double checked in the field, which was the case in uh, this figure from an experiment led by none other than Cornell's Dr. Matt Fry. Of course, the million dollar question the public wants answered is, what will these insects eat when their host plant has been reduced? And it's important to note that we're working with specialists. They've evolved over thousands of years to deal with specific secondary plant chemicals. And I like to tell the general public that plants have a chemical fingerprint that's unique to them, like our fingerprint is unique to us as an individual. And it's these chemicals that cue the insect to feed or reproduce. Absent those cues, absent their host plant, they're going to disperse looking for their host or they're going to die. They're not gonna just switch over to feeding on whatever else happens to be nearby. 
Again, this is a, a highly regulated process which involves extensive testing and through the long history of biological control, there are really only two systems where there are cases of extensive damage to non-target plants, both of which were predictable from the host range assessments. And these are releases that would not be permitted today in, in the regulatory environment that we currently operate in where safety is paramount. Again, it's also important to remember that the goal is to reduce, not eliminate the host. Eventually, you have the weed and the agent oscillating and hopefully down to a much lower level of abundance in which it's no longer causing the same ecological or economic effects. So let's jump into the first, first system here. This is Dioscorea bulbifera or air potato. It gets its name because of these bulbils, the propagules that form in the leaf axles. Um, some people call these Florida snowballs, but you get hit with one of these and a concussion is, is likely. Uh, they are definitely very, very hard. Uh, the plant is perennial but deciduous. So when the vines die back in the winter, the bulbils fall to the ground. And then the next spring, you get new vines emerging from the bulbils or from these subterranean tubers. There's only vegetative reproduction in, uh, in the introduced range. This is incredibly difficult to kill with herbicides because they don't translocate into the tubers. So prior to the biological control program, the most effective way to control this plant was through volunteer roundups, uh, where people would literally walk through parks picking up these air potatoes. Uh, in the Gainesville area alone, in a seven year window prior to the biological control program really kicking in, volunteers picked up 220,000 pounds of air potatoes. So effective, but not necessarily the most efficient way to control a weed. Thankfully, we now have Liliaceris chenai. Uh, this charismatic microfauna is, is going to be a, a textbook case of successful weed biological control. The insect is multivoltine, eggs are laid on the leaves, larvae and adults consume the leaves, and they can be very damaging. So for example, on the left, uh, this is a plot just prior to release of the biological control agent. And several months later, you can see the air potato vines have all senesced. This is premature, not natural seasonal senescence. And the native wild coffee plant that had been suppressed and smothered is now released. So things were looking quite good with the potential for this agent. However, very early on in the program, it was clear that there were some questions and concerns about the agent's ability to overwinter, uh, particularly in the first release sites in South Florida. So some early field cage work showed very high overwintering mortality. And there's a, a bit of a phenological mismatch in the spring with the vine emerging uh, much earlier than the beetles. The initial releases were made with a Chinese genotype, but we also had access to a Nepalese genotype of the species. And that prompted the question of whether releasing the second genotype would benefit the biological control effort. Despite the overwintering concerns, there was really great efficacy in the field. So there were certainly concerns that releasing a second genotype might potentially disrupt the effective control. So we wanted to look at a, a variety of aspects of the biology of the two genotypes prior to making this decision. Now, air potato has a distribution throughout the southeastern US, although Florida is the primary area of concern. And if we look at this in terms of plant hardiness zones and get, get an idea of temperature, Florida really does encompass most of the range invaded by the weed. So we were able to set up a big collaborative experiment over multiple winters with field cages in these different plant hardiness zones to take a closer look at this plant hardiness or this overwintering question with the two genotypes. So um, just to make note of these sites, this is Tallahassee, Gainesville, Fort Pierce, and Homestead, which is south of Miami. So through the multiple winters that we had these field cages in place, in no year, no site, did the Chinese genotype outperform the Nepalese genotype in terms of the percent of beetles alive at the end of the study. In fact, 
when we looked at the data overall, the Nepalese beetles had a 40% higher likelihood of surviving the winter. And interestingly, that held true at the extremes of the range. Now, granted, survival was quite poor in Homestead, but still better than the Chinese genotype, but significantly higher in Tallahassee in the more northern part of the range. So it seems like the Nepalese genotype has a, a broader ecological envelope. And when we tried to explore the mechanism behind that, one of the things that we looked at was fat content. So we harvested beetles from these cages monthly from all the sites. I'm showing you the, the data just pooled by month here. And uh, you can see when we extracted the fat body, the Nepalese beetles entered the winter with significantly more fat content than the Chinese beetles, although this was not significant by the end of the year. Uh, we certainly in the homestead site saw the beetles running around in the cages in the winter prior to air potato being available in the spring. And we think this is contributing to their uh, depletion of flat body. So, okay, Nepalese beetle is, is looking like maybe a better fit, particularly for the northern sites, but there were additional potential complications. So during our lab work, we noticed that the genotypes would readily hybridize. And some further work demonstrated that this was through a, a random mating pattern. So this then prompted the question, again, with the concern of disrupting the success that we were already having, with this hybridization, would you potentially get hybrid vigor or hybrid depression? So we set up an experiment to test this where we had uh, the pure Chinese and Nepalese lines and reciprocal crosses of them. And we monitored fecundity for multiple generations. Sometimes it takes time for these effects to manifest. So I'm showing you the F2 fecundity data. And you can see um, in this particular case, the Nepalese genotype had higher fecundity than the Chinese in terms of the total eggs per, per female. And when we look at the reciprocal causes, they either did not differ from the parents or we had superior performance. So thankfully, no signs of hybrid depression here. And that ultimately led to the decision to start releasing the Nepalese genotype, and it is the primary genotype being released in the more northern parts of the range, particularly uh, in Louisiana, where there's some really problematic infestations. Additionally, we took things a step further and conducted host range testing with the hybrids. Although we did not anticipate that hybridization would lead to any changes in host range, we did test this also with multiple generations, focusing on the congeners of the target lead. So now we've got these beetles out in the field, but we have another potential complication. And uh, this is a species that you may be familiar with in New York, Liliaceris lilii, or lily leaf beetle. This is a pest insect and it consumes numerous species in the Liliaceae, both cultivated and native lily species. And the larvae are quite distinct in that they are covered with really robust fecal shields, and this will become a bigger part of our story later. So amongst the broad range of species that can be attacked are some threatened native species. So based on concerns about this pest insect, uh, Lisa Casagrande and, or sorry, Lisa Tewksbury and Dick Casagrande at University of Rhode Island initiated a biological control program. This was certainly assisted by the fact that there are no native Liliaceae species present in North America. So that certainly helped with their testing process. And I want to make note of the timeline here. They ultimately received permission to release two ichneumonid and one eulophid species in 1999 and 2002. So their release permits predated the start of the weed biological control program with air potato. It wasn't until 2002 that two scientists from IPRL were traveling in Nepal where they observed Liliaceris beetles feeding on air potato. And in fact, it wasn't until four years later that those beetles were actually imported into our quarantine facility. Ballparking current range of these, these species right now uh, there have been some reports in southeastern Pennsylvania of Liliaceris lilii, but the, they're really patchy here in the southern part of the range, much more common in New England. 
the parasitoid species are quite successful and they are geographically lagging behind their host a bit. And again, air potato has a distribution in the southeastern part of the US with releases actively being made through a mass rearing program in those areas. So we've got two successful biological control programs, one targeting a weed, one targeting an insect. Ranges are expanding. So the question became, if we get range overlap, could the Liliaceris lilii parasitoids attack the congeneric weed biological control agent Liliaceris chenai? And worst case scenario, could that disrupt two highly effective biological control programs? So we collaborated with Lisa and Dick to test this. Uh, we ran a series of no choice tests in small arenas as well as large cages with uh, full size plants with the parasitoids and the two larval species. We had no successful parasitization of Liliaceris chenai. We also ran a series of choice tests in petri dishes. So we have a larva of each species on plant material it's fed on. We would release parasitoids into the petri dish and record their behavior. So as the parasitoids are roaming around the dish and uh, getting cues from the larvae, they can start exercising their, their host choice, host seeking behaviors. And we recorded the number of times that they physically touched either larval species or the number of times that they attempted to ovipositor or probe. So typically you get escalation of touching, then probing. And even once a female probes the larva, they can still choose whether or not to lay an egg at that point. So they can probe and then reject a host. So in these tests, uh, oh, we're gonna ignore Lamophagus arabundus, one of the uh, Ichneumonids, our sample size was pretty low, but looking at the eulophid and the other ichneumonid, when we looked at the ratio of ovipositor probes per contact, you can see there was a significant preference for exploring Liliaceris larvae, their host, versus Liliaceris chenai. In fact, in the 78 trials that we ran, we only had a parasitoid probe a Liliaceris chenai larva twice. We reared larvae, again, did not get any, any parasitism of Liliaceris chenai. So in trying to determine what was driving this parasitoid behavior, one of the things we looked at was the phylogeny. The Liliaceris lilii is from Europe, while Liliaceris chenai is of Asian origin. And when we constructed a phylogeny, they grouped out accordingly. So we've got a clade with the European species and the parasitoids have uh, varying attack levels on Lilii, Tibialis, and Mer Mergigera from Europe, whereas Liliaceris chenai, our air potato agent, grouped out completely separately. And uh, I do want to note here, Liliaceris agena is a new biological control agent for air potato. The release permit was issued this year. The first releases were made this summer. And this is a specialist on the actual bulbs, on, on the air potatoes rather than consuming the leaves. So we do have some clear phylogenetic differences here, but what we think is really driving the parasitoid behavior is this fecal shield. So in Lilii, this is quite robust. In Chennai, uh, the larvae are kind of slimy and that Slime serves as a, a substrate for some fecal material to stick to them, but it, it's nothing like, like the fecal shield we see in Lilii. Uh, work was done in Europe, both through the host range testing process for the parasitoids and some additional research that demonstrated that these fecal shields were, not surprisingly, carrying cues from the host plants. Liliaceris lilii is feeding on Liliaceae, while the air potato beetles are feeding on a completely different family, Dioscoriaceae. So this interaction with the parasitoids is likely being mediated through host plant cues in these fecal shields. We did briefly attempt some fecal shield transplants, but the larvae were completely uncooperative and kept flicking the shields off. So we, so we didn't get any, any further with the, uh, the testing process there, trying to fool the parasitoids by moving the shields. So switching to another system where we're concerned about biotic resistance, which thankfully does not appear to be a cause for concern in the Liliaceris system there, 
Uh, again, this is my primary target, old world climbing fern, Ligodium microfilum. This is a true fern. So what you would think of as a typical fern, frond or leaf or rachis, in this case grows indeterminately, trailing horizontally or climbing vertically to a, a length of nearly 30 meters in some cases. Uh, clearly smothers everything in its path. This is a fern and a prolific spore producer. A piece of fertile frond material about the size of your thumbnail could contain 30,000 spores and these spores can self or they can outcross. So uh, this is problematic in many ways. It also is able to, dis to invade both disturbed and pristine sites like that early photo I showed you from Everglades National Park. This weed, much like air potato, is very difficult to kill with herbicides because they don't translocate well into the rhizome. So you can achieve top kill, but the plant grows back and you have a bunch of dead rachis material left behind. And that dead rachis material is also problematic in these tree skirts. So while these are green externally, below that green vegetation are tight, tight masses of dead rachises. And this material drastically alters the way that fire behaves in these invaded systems. Prescribed burns, uh, natural fires are, are, are very common in these habitats. And when you have Ligodium tree skirts present, they can carry fire into areas that don't typically burn, that aren't adapted to burning like uh, tree canopies. One of the two agents that is established against this weed is Neomusotema conspercatalis. This is a small crambit about a centimeter in wingspan. My team is mass rearing and releasing this insect as part of the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. The larvae consume the leaves, but as in the case with many biological control programs, the agent becomes part of the food web and is consumed by predators and attacked by parasitoids in the introduced range. And unfortunately with this caterpillar, which doesn't have much in the way of any sort of defense behavior, it is um, a bit of a buffet out there. So focusing on parasitoids, to date we've documented nine parasitoid species attacking the eggs, larvae, and pupae of our weed biological control agent. Now, we aren't at the point yet of being able to say whether or not these are having population level impacts, but we certainly can see quite high levels of parasitism at certain times of the year in the field. Likewise, Neomusitima can achieve very high population levels. They can outbreak and can actually cause big brownout events where they will also top kill large areas of Ligodium. So this leads us to a, a broader set of ecological questions that we were able to explore thanks to some funding through uh, USDA and uh, the AFRI program. So one of the concerns that has been raised about weed biological control is how it might disrupt native communities. So specifically, you release an agent like the Neomusitima caterpillar, it builds up big levels in the field on essentially unlimited food resources. Native predators and parasitoids might take advantage of this novel food resource, so spill over and start attacking the agent, which is absolutely happening in, in this system. So then the question becomes, do those native parasitoids and predators build up artificially high populations on this novel resource and then spill back and disproportionately attack their native hosts at higher levels than they would have been able to in the absence of this novel food resource. So we explored this in a couple of systems, including the old world climbing fern system. So for this particular experiment, we identified eight field sites. Four had Ligodium microfilum and the biological control agent present, four did not. All of these sites had naturally occurring populations of bald cypress, red maple, and wax myrtle. We planted additional saplings of these species in these sites. So here's what one of the sites looked like at the time of planting. So now we have our focal trees that we've planted. We have mature individuals of these species present in the site that can source, be, uh, source population of Lepidopterans, which was our focus here. So for the course of a year, we monitored these sites, we examined each of these trees, we collected any Lepidopteran eggs or larvae or pupae that we could find, 
we reared them through and we got either an adult LEP or a parasitoid. And our goal was to assess whether the parasitoid community differed between the sites with and without the biological control agent present. Unfortunately, COVID has slowed down some of uh, this, this identification work, but what I can tell you based on just the sheer number of parasitoid species reared is that we are not seeing big differences mediated by the presence of the biological control agent. It is not changing these parasitoid communities. We have a, a very small percentage of individuals that could represent overlap between the native LEPs and the weed biological control agent, again, waiting for final ID on those species. We conducted similar work with the water hyacinth plant, so working in an aquatic system at this point. And uh, again, aquatic, but this is actually a lake with an incredible infestation of water hyacinth. Uh, widely regarded as one of the world's worst aquatic weeds, very heavily managed with herbicides, and this is true in Florida as well. So while we have um, two weevil biological control agents that are quite effective, the larvae feed internally in water hyacinth. And when you treat the hyacinth with herbicide, the plant sinks and the biological control agents go down with the ship. The most recently introduced agent is Megamelis scutellaris. This delphacid is less damaging overall than the two weevil species. However, the nymphs and the adults feed externally. So when you treat a patch, they're able to move and find untreated refugia. So there's uh, extensive work being done on integrated weed management in the system and, and Megamella scutellaris is, is a big player in that work. Co-occurring in many of these field sites is the native cow lily, Nufarludia. Uh, this native is host to a native Megamella species, Megamellus divisi. Megamellus divisi, in turn, is host to a native mimarid parasitoid, Calopolynema ema. So you can guess where we're going here. We are interested in shared parasitism and indirect effects that could be happening in these systems where we have hyacinth and nufar and the two Megamellus species present. So we're looking for apparent competition, an indirect effect where the two Megamella species aren't directly competing for resources, they're feeding on different host plants. However, they have the shared parasitoid and that can lead to apparent competition. So we were specifically in investigating how and to what extent the Mimarid was using the weed biological control agent what was the nature of the interactions between all these different constituents? And were those interactions mediated by any sort of spatial or temporal effects? So addressing that spatial question, we were fortunate to have access to these nine replicate ponds on site. And within those ponds, we set up a resource subsidy, a population of water hyacinth with the Megamellus scutellaris present. And then we caged NUFAR plants at different distances from that source population of Megamellus uh, scutellaris. Within those NUFAR plants, we sampled for Megamellus divisi and for the parasitoid. And when we look at the mean parasitism of our native Megamellus species, you can see that there was no significant effect of distance from the water hyacinth on the parasitism of the native. Likewise, when we collected the mimarid on sticky cards located at different distances from that subsidy source population of the weed biological control agent, there was no relationship there either. We did a more extensive study where we were able to manipulate levels of these different players in mesocosms. So here we have five treatments. We have a control with none of the herbivores present. We have a parasitoid control with just the two Megamella species. We had a treatment testing for direct effects of the parasitoid on the native Megamellus, a direct effect test of the parasitoid species on our weed biological control agent, and our indirect treat effect treatment where we had both Megamella species and the mimarid present. 
So if we look at mean parasitism again of our native Megamelis species, let's focus on the treatment between the native Megamelis and the Mimarid and the treatment that has both Megamelis species and the Mimarid present. And we found that there was no significant difference in the parasitism of the native when the weed biological control agent was present. So again, we're not seeing this indirect effect. We're not seeing food web changes because of the presence of the resource subsidy from the weed biological control agent. I want to mention that we, we are all for a critical look at, at this practice of weed biological control. Our concern in the case of these indirect effects is that most of the critiques have either been theoretical or have been uh, very short-term field studies. And we're trying to add more data to this conversation about these potential indirect effects that can result from weed biological control. So switching gears entirely for the, uh, the last bit of the talk here, uh, I wanna to talk to an IPM group about IPM. This is Myla Minute Wheat, Persicaria profoliata. Uh, much of the work I'm gonna talk about today was done while I was a grad student in Judy Huff Goldstein's lab at the University of Delaware. And uh, Myla Minute Wheat is, is a really unique plant in some ways. It is an annual, so seed production is going to become a big part of the story here. And uh, it produces these bright blue fruits, so that's pretty unusual. The leaves when they fully expand are perfect triangles. And you also get these circular leaves, these ochria on the stems. Uh, Midribs stems are covered with these backward projecting thorns that aid in the climbing ability. And you can see it certainly has the potential to smother everything in its path. We call this the uh, Snoopy on the doghouse topiary. So Milo Minute was accidentally introduced to the U.S. as a seed contaminant in the 1930s in South Central Pennsylvania, and it, it spread. And it spread enough that the, the Forest Service became really concerned about impacts of this weed and initiated a biological control program in 1996. Uh, the range of the weed is still ongoing. It is certainly a concern in New York State. And uh, Thankfully, the range of the biological control agent is also expanding. And that agent is a curculionid weevil, Ronaconomus latipes, which was approved for release in 2004, the same year that I joined Judy's lab. The weevil is multivoltine. Eggs are laid on the leaves, stems, and the developing flower capitula. Larvae bore into the first unoccupied node as soon as they emerge from the egg. And you don't always get this extensive feeding damage, but all larval feeding is internal. They then drop out of the stem and pupate in the soil and emerge as jet black adults, but get this rusty orange color from feeding on the plant. So this is an incredibly host specific insect. Again, that's how we get approval for release of weed biological control agents. So just to visually highlight this, all the leaves with holes in this picture are mile a minute weed. And this is a native congener Persicaria sagittata. So the Huff Goldstein lab conducted years worth of studies looking at different aspects of mile a minute growth, weevil behavior, interactions between the two. And I'm gonna highlight a couple of those studies that eventually fed their way into some broader integrated weed management work. So this was a fully factorial study in the sun and shade with weevils present or absent. This was via exclusion with a systemic insecticide. And we got further experimental confirmation here of some of our field observations that the weevils uh, really had a preference for being in the sun. And mile a minute performed better in the sun than the shade. Weevils likewise had a greater impact when they were in sunny versus shady habitats. And weevil performance is linked to seed production and seed viability. Again, an important aspect of management given that this is an annual plant and an annual plant that produces seeds that can persist for six years in the seed bank. So one cause for concern and initial experimentation in the system was as this plant was really undergoing rage expansion in the mid-Atlantic, some land managers were using the color change from green to blue fruits 
as a trigger of when to start implementing management, typically herbicide or physical removal. However, green fruits were present for a good portion of the season, and we were really concerned that they might be viable, and thus this waiting for food, the color change to occur to implement management could be contributing viable seed to the seed bank. And experimentally, that's exactly what we were able to demonstrate, that uh, at certain points of the year, quite a high percentage of those green immature seeds were actually viable. We did this um, through some germination experiments as well as TTZ assays of seeds. So in thinking about big picture management, we've learned now that weevil feeding directly on these developing seed clusters reduces seed weight and viability, and indirect feeding on the entire plant also reduces the number of mature seeds and the number of seeds in each cluster. So a couple of years into the program, we had sites that we were really happy to see situations like this. We have a couple of mile a minute seedlings early in the spring. They're being attacked by the weevil and they're competing with mostly native vegetation. In these circumstances, you tended to get plants that never made it to the canopy, again, this is a light adapted vine, and the mile a minute never got the light resources it needed to seed. However, we also had situations like this, where we were getting some control of the target weed, but we were getting replacement of mile a minute with other non-desirable species, the invasive species treadmill effect. And in, in many of our sites in southeastern Pennsylvania and northern Delaware, the primary replacement species was Japanese stiltgrass. So we continued to sort of piece together the, what we were learning about the biology of the plant and the agent and conducted a series of experiments in field cages, in this case, directly looking at the role of competition and weevils. So we isolated within each of these cages, isolated down to one naturally growing mile a minute plant. We left the other plant competition in these cages, trimmed them at a height of a, a, about a half meter, released weevils and monitored the cages. We actually had to end this experiment early because we had such high mortality in, uh, in these integrated treatments. And we also observed delayed seed production. So what we determined here was that weevil feeding can change plant architecture in a way that makes mile a minute less competitive. So again, the adult feed, feed on the capitulum, and this can cause a loss of apical dominance. Larvae can feed within the stem, and this can cause a loss, uh, a reduction in the internode length, both of which reduce the ability of the plant to climb. So for those who aren't as familiar with apical dominance, we've got a light adapted vine here, most of the resources are being channeled towards this, this apical bud. This promotes vertical growth and these lateral buds are held dormant. But when that apical meristem is damaged, these lateral buds are released from dormancy and you get a, a much shorter, shrubbier looking plant. So here, here's what that looks like on a mile a minute vine where the apical meristem has been damaged and the lateral ones are now growing. So we wanted to conduct an integrated weed management experiment where we actually created plant competition and provided the weevil as well as an herbicide treatment. So we had four treatments, a control, a low density planting of Euthamia graminifolia, this is grass-leaved goldenrod, a pretty aggressive native, a higher density planting of those plugs, and for a treatment that would have additional shade and shade that would grow quite quickly, we used elm tree saplings, and these were uh, tolerant of Dutch elm disease. The following spring, we randomly split the plots in half. We treated half of these plots with the pre-emergent herbicide prodiamine. We released additional weevils, and we monitored plots within these treatment areas. This is what they looked like about a year after planting. We did protect the elm trees with deer fencing, and you can see here where the spray line was based on the height of the elm trees on one side of the plot and the abundance of Japanese stilt grass on the other. Mile a minute can produce huge numbers of seeds and resulting seedlings. We counted these in the spring. And in 2009, when the pre-emergent was applied, there were significantly fewer seedlings in the herbicide treatment, but some were still present. Some had started to germinate prior to that application. 
Again, it was just a one-time application in 2009, but there were still significantly fewer seedlings in the herbicide plots in 2010 and 2011. But our real focus was on the plant community response. So we were fortunate to have the help of a local botanist who helped us ID each plant to species and estimate the cover of each of those species within these plots. So while we looked at traditional metrics like species richness and species diversity, they didn't really tell the whole story in the way that summing up the cover of native versus non-native plants in these plots did. So you can see there's significantly more native plant cover where we integrated the treatments and that was uh, with the herbicide versus no herbicide overall, as well as the planted versus the unplanted control within the herbicide treatment. Euthamia graminifolia, despite being a really aggressive native, performed quite poorly in the absence of the pre-emergent herbicide. And Japanese stilt grass was almost non-existent in the fully integrated plots, but was quite dominant where the pre-emergent was not used. So uh, at the end of grad school, we were pretty content with how these native plant communities were looking in these sites. And then we unexpectedly got access to these sites again in 2012 and 2015. So 2012, three years after that one-time herbicide application, we're still seeing a significant effect of the herbicide. By 2015, it was no longer significant. However, you can see seedlings were maintained at quite low levels in these plots six years post-treatment. If we look at how that translated into an abbreviated look at the plant community in 2015, in crosslands, there were some seedlings in the spring, very little cover in the fall, but the absolute dominant was Japanese stiltgrass. And there were few native plants present in that meadow. So our recommendation to the site was to treat with a grass specific herbicide. Waterloo Mill still looked terrific six years out, basically no mile a minute. Euthamia was present, but not dominant. No microstesium. The, the sites had great native plant communities. The laurels was a real surprise. Mile a minute made a resurgence. We're not sure if there was a flooding event or some other disturbance that really reintroduced it to the site. Euthamia, which was abundant, was non-existent. And that site became dominated by some goldenrod species as well as some native and non-native rugas. So the take home message, and as far as I'm concerned, the, the biggest challenge in land management is the need for adaptive management to, to know that these sites will vary and management has to be customized accordingly. Uh, thank the many funding organizations, collaborators, technicians, and students that contributed to the research. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you, Ellen. All right. So uh, yeah, we've got about uh, five minutes for questions. Um, and I guess just to get started, I'll, I'll ask a, a quick one. Uh, I wrote down a few, let's see which one is the best. Um, I guess, how, how often, it, 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 for all these weed species, these invasive weeds that you mentioned, there seem to be a, um, a, a host specific uh, herbivore or herbivorous, herbivorous arthropod. Is that, is that, uh, common for, for um, you know, could, could I find one for Palmer amaranth, which I'm worried about in New York? Um, it, yeah. It certainly is the case for some of these really problematic species. Um, the, the key though is often what, what congeners, what closely related plants are present in the native range. Are they similar chemically, um, you know, phylogenetically? In some cases, you will have, for example, kudzu, uh, a plant that you have specific herbivores in the native range, but they really like soybeans, and that's a problem. So it, it's a broader question of just finding the specialist, but what else is present? What else is of concern? And how, how do the specialists behave with, with relation to those very closely related plants? For example, in the Ligodium system, we do a lot of work testing um, in potential impacts on the native Ligodium palmatum because our Ligodium microfilum specialists are really specialists more at the genus than the species level. Okay, great. All right, other questions? Uh, Matt has his hand raised. <laughs> 
Yeah. So Ellen, I was curious about, um, I was going to try and type this question, but then I didn't know how to spell bul bulbules, bul uh, not even sure how to say it. So Air I was potatoes. curious, <laughs> how, um, how does the Liliacera um, Aegina feed on that? And is it, um, if they start feeding on it, do they kill it? Or is it like a matter of how much feeding um, in order to affect that structure? Some of those details are still worked out, being worked out. We have been able to test some of that in the quarantine system. Um, Alan Dre is the, the PI on that. Um, the the bulbs are really rock hard and the the females will chew into the, the, be the bulbul, they'll start tunneling and then they'll lay the eggs within that feeding damage. And the larvae are then able to feed internally and they can just turn the whole thing to mush. So if you think a rotten potato smells bad, you should try a rotten air potato. Interesting. So they're a leaf beetle, but they, they feed internally on the structure. The chenai is primarily a leaf feeder. Aegina is primarily a bulbul feeder. So there's some really interesting niche partitioning within that system as well. Great. Okay, go ahead, Brian. All right. Yeah. So just picking up where you left off there, um, I didn't catch um, how the elms fit into the system with the mile a minute weed. And maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more on uh, the adaptation that uh, you said is important when uh, implementing a, a system like that? Uh, so the elms we had access to because of Forest Service sponsors and elms grow really quickly. So they were great for creating shade in uh, in that system. Um, can you uh, please clarify the, what, what particularly are you interest, uh, interested in about the adaptation? Well, um, I guess it was based on the different sites and maybe if uh, grasses were coming in. Mm. And that type yeah, of thing. Uh, you know, we tried to pair the sites as, as carefully as we could in terms of being similar at the start of the study, but the, they took different trajectories. Um, sure. And that some of that was quite, quite surprising. I, I would have expected the laurels and the Waterloo Mill sites to both be in really great shape with natives. Uh, based on how they looked at the end of the study, and that just was not the case. Um, based on the abundance of stilt grass at the other site, the writing was on the wall that that, that could become a problem. Sure. Thanks. Okay, maybe one final question. If nobody else has another question, I'll, I'll ask about the overall mile a minute program. Has there been um, a sense that this is a great success or is mile a minute range still expanding and is there still concern about um, the impacts it's having? I'd say a mixed bag. Um, there are definitely places where you have a real reduction in the need for management because of the, the weevil, but you know, how do you define success and what are your objectives? If your objectives are restoring plant communities, then the weevil alone in, in some sites is not going to be enough to achieve that. Um, there certainly is um, cause for concern and I'm, I'm really hoping to um, potentially follow up on this sometime with, with Lisa Tewksbury up in Rhode Island. Um, we've got additional data showing that abiotic conditions, particularly in the spring, really of a given season for mile a minute in the weevil. So for example, in a cool weather, the plant really seems to get a uh, starts growing prolifically, the weevils and we did temperature dependent development work and developed simple models where we showed you could get a reduction in a generation or two potentially with really adverse spring conditions. So the weevil populations may not in those years achieve damaging levels. Knowing what we know about the seed bank, it may be advantageous to implement other management in those years so you don't get a big pulse of seed contribution. And in the northern parts of the range, it seems like in a typical year, because of those temperature differences, you don't get as many generations. This is something that we, we need to delve into further, but there is, there is certainly a 
possibility of reduced efficacy in more northern areas because of uh, reduced population de development. Uh, Brian, do you, do you still have your hand up for another question, or is that from your first? Oh, question? sorry, that I need to <laughs> lower that. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Anyone else? Um, well, I guess uh, I'll formally uh, end the um, I guess. Uh, the talk and Q&A section of the session and ask uh, if, if anyone has a special interest and just wants to chat more informally with Ellen at this time, uh, you're welcome to stay on. Uh, otherwise, uh, everyone else is uh, welcome to sign out. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. And thanks again, Ellen, um, for presenting today. <laughs> Absolutely, thanks for having me. Great. Yeah, I was I was uh, interested with the idea that um, that you could bring in the the biocontrol for the climbing fern, but there's all these other parasitoids that could potentially you know feast on the biocontrol and increase their populations to the level that that they would move over and decimate um, other native insects. Is is that is that a common uh, effect or or um, yeah, did, did you end up finding evidence for that? We, we did not in either either system that we explored. Um, it certainly is a, a valid concern, and there are some practitioners who would advocate exploring the uh, effect of parasitism in the native range and seeing if, you know, there are potential uh, similar parasitoids in the native range, or sorry, in the introduced range before pursuing that. So if if an insect is really suppressed in the native range by parasitoids, is that likely to happen in the introduced range? Well, it, it's hard to say, right? And um, I, I would say that the parasitoids that we are working with are a mixture of specialists and generalists. So a generalist is a generalist, right? It's, it's just gonna take care of whatever is available. So I have, I have mixed feelings about that as a screening tool when considering candidate agents. Um, I don't think there are likely to be negative interactions between weed and arthropod biological control systems all that often, but that interaction is something that I'm, I'm really interested in. And I, I think it would certainly be beneficial. They tend to be separate practitioners working in weed versus arthropod biological control. And I'd like to see more interaction between those groups. Great, yeah, that's a good point. Truly integrated. <laughs> hey, Ellen, uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen, I have a, a quick question. Uh, and Brian, is, I don't know if Brian is still here, but uh, so we have this spotted lanternfly, right? And uh, it, it thrives, uh, it follows that another invasive tree, uh, the tree of heaven. I'm not familiar with these cases of bug control, but is there like biological control agents that are being used to target host plants that uh, promotes the uh, establishment and spread of invasive insects like the spotted lanternfly? So if we can put aside all the, the growing concerns about existing and increasing damage from spotted lanternfly, it is a fascinating system, right? Talk about an invasional meltdown or cascade. And well, I certainly hope this leads to more Ilanthus control down the road. Um, there are biological control programs in development for both spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. Um, at the moment, what seems to be particularly um, effective as far as a management tool in some natural areas and, and something that, that's being practiced in, in places in Pennsylvania, um, and I'm sure elsewhere, I'm just particularly familiar with work at one site, um, they are using the spotted lanternfly problem as a reason to target ailanthus control, which in itself is, is difficult to manage based on the way it can respond to different uh, cutting and herbicide techniques. Uh, but they are managing ailanthus, leaving a few target plants, a few large, basically sentinel uh, plants 
allowing the spotted lanternfly to really congregate on those few plants on the landscape and then hitting those plants with a systemic insecticide. So they're basically using them as traps and then killing large numbers of lanternflies on those plants. That's what we're doing here in New York, right, Brian? In yes, South yes. America. And uh, I do believe there is a, um, a, a pathogen that is uh, effective for Alanthus control. It's a fusarium, however. And fusarium, uh, although this one is specific, fusariums are an important crop pest. So the chances of getting approval to distribute that um, might not be that great. But there, yeah. are, there are advocates for that. Yep, um, Scott Salem's group at uh, U oh. University of Virginia, or sorry, Virginia Tech is working on that. There are also some folks at, at West Virginia. Um, they are, they're all also testing um, a, a weevil for Tree of Heaven as well. Oh, I didn't know about that, that's cool, yeah. Are there congeners of Ilanthus in? Oh, that's a good question, I don't know. I'm not aware of any, but. Yeah, but I'll be real sad to see see that nasty plant disappear <laughs> from the landscape. <laughs> I did kill my first spotted lantern fly this year. Oh, where were I, you at? I, I was uh, visiting family in Pennsylvania and oh. uh, wow, they're huge. You know, the first time I, I saw an adult, wow. Yes. That's a lot of lantern fly. It, <laughs> they're impressive. You didn't add it to your collection? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> At this point, you know, if it fell out on the way, it could be a regulatory incident. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that um, science fair in Kansas, How that was kind of wild. One? Yeah. Yeah, well, I got to ask, um, how about that alligator? What, what was the circumstance? <laughs> So I, I mentioned earlier, um, that photo always makes me laugh. It was, um, it was a, a tour of the Everglades and a place where they were rehabbing animals or re, you know, disorienting and re-releasing problem animals. So they had some young alligators and, you know, I, when someone dares me to hold something, I don't typically back down. So yeah, I was holding the alligator there, but it makes me laugh because my, my three-year-old nephew thinks it's a puppet. I'm like, no, no, it's, it's, it's a real alligator. No, it's a puppet. So I say, I can't get street cred with the kids on that. Oh, but maybe if he was convinced, he would want to do that too when he comes to visit and maybe that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, okay. Wow. So you, you don't encounter those. It, it sounds like you uh, do some work in the Everglades or keep track of. Yeah, um, we, we certainly are cognizant, particularly when we're in flooded sites of um, the possibilities of, of alligator encounters and their really specific safety protocols we follow. That's more of a problem for people who are working with, with the aquatics like water hyacinth. But yeah, you do have to certainly be cognizant. Um, I have not encountered a python in the field, but they are certainly out there as well. Um, and a lab next door to mine does the necropsy work when they bring those in. And um, they're impressively and terrifyingly large and angry. And um, I, I held one of those and it was just all muscle. Someone had the business end pinned and I had part of the body, but yeah, just a raging mass of muscle. And another invasive. Exactly. And the uh, invasive reptiles certainly get a ton of attention in Florida and they are causing devastating effects on native communities, um, but sometimes out, outshadow the effects that the plants are having. They had a contest a few years ago, right? Uh, I remember the first one, it was a group from uh, students from Harvard. Is that, is that right? They, they, they catch they, they, they do train, yeah, they do train people and have these contests to have people try to go out and catch pythons, but it's, it's a, you know, it's probably much more effective as an education than a management tool because it's a drop in the bucket what they pull in compared to the, uh, the estimated populations. Is there any um, coordination between your program and like maybe a master not a master gardener program, but like a master forestry program or a master land manager program to, to work with biocontrol and sort of this integrated approach at um, University of Florida? 
Uh, so we certainly give talks for master naturalists, master gardener programs. Um, one of the things that was uh, the biggest perspective change for me in, in moving from the mid-Atlantic to Florida was the scale on which management occurs. So the state is divided into um, large water management districts and much larger parcels of land are managed within those districts in addition to you know, the preserves, the national parks, et cetera. So there, there is quite coordinated efforts both within those water management districts that have their own huge vegetation management teams as well as between those districts in certain ways and uh, the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan plays a big role in, in one particular in the South Florida Water Management District there. And that's a big coordinated effort involving the Army Corps of Engineers as well. Um, but I'm, I'm fortunate that invasive weeds are such a large management concern that I get funding from some of those water management districts, both for development and implementation of field releases. Yeah, it just seemed like one of your take home messages was um, about the importance of long term management, and especially in the case of the mile minute weed where, you know, it was looking like it was headed in one trajectory and then the results later were different. So it um, seems like working with those land managers is important, but in Florida, it sounds like they've got that worked out. Quite nice. There certainly is very active communication between them. Um, we are conducting an integrated weed management experiment within the old world climbing fern system right now. We're just on the early stages of that without a whole lot of data to report yet. But that experiment was specifically designed based on questions that the land managers wanted answered. Uh, particularly related to treatment intervals and whether integrating biological control with herbicide could allow you to spray less frequently and thus treat more land overall. Okay, great. I think we better let Ellen go. I, I just uh, put her website with her uh, contact information um, in the chat. So if you'd like to continue the conversation, um, you're welcome to contact Ellen through that. Um, but yeah, once again, Ellen, thanks again. and. Uh, that was that was a fascinating presentation, and uh, yeah, I hope uh, maybe we can work together in the future. Yeah, that'd be terrific. Thank you, Ellen. And send us uh, stories uh, about Matt from grad school. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no. There, there are fortunately not too many embarrassing photos. What happens in grad school stays in grad. Stays in grad school. <laughs> I, I like, I like that approach. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Thank, you Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.